Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us at our virtual worship service at the Pleasant Grove Missionary Baptist Church. Thank you. Good morning. Howdy. What's up? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord God Almighty. He's the King of glory. Y'all, it's, it's celebration time. God has brought us through all last week. Let us sleep last night and touch us with the finger of love this morning, and we rose, and our minds should be stayed up on him. And I don't know about you, but the Lord is blessing me, and he's blessing me right now. Let's stand together and join along with our music ministry. The Lord is blessing me.
oxygen. Yeah, the Lord is blessing me right now. Oh, clap your hands and, and make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. That's a powerful song. That's a moving song. That's a cardio song, and that's a good song to, to start off worshiping the one who is great. Almighty God, this first Sunday in March, January has come, February has come, and both are gone. And here we are in March, and before you know it, it'll be gone. But blessed be the name of the Lord that he promised us that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. I will call your attention to Bible scripture reading, and we need the word of the Lord in these last troublesome days that we're in. In the book of Hebrews, we'll see there in the 11th chapter, you'll see verse one through six reading from the King James Version. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse one and verse six, define these words, King James. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. For by it, elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying in his gift, scripture says, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let us pray together. Father, you are from everlasting to everlasting. You're God and you're awesome. You're God all by yourself. You rule and you super rule. You're the great I am the rose of Sharon, the bright and morning star, the wheel in the middle of a wheel, bridge over troubled waters, peace in the midst of a storm. Father, you are our king. You are our deliverer. You are our sustenance. You are our joy. You are our healing. You're the way maker. You're God and you're God and you're God all by yourself. Thank you this morning that as we approach your throne, we are not worthy. For all of us have sinned and we've come short of your glory, made some mistakes, left some things undone, but Lord, we come before you confessing it. And you said, if we do that, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, thank you for owning us as your children. And we'll never be ashamed of you, O oh God. For you've been mighty good to us. We slept last night and you woke us up this morning. And now we're standing humbled in adoration and praise and honor magnifying and glorifying your name, telling the dying world that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you this morning, Lord, that you give us an opportunity to come and 
stand with the brothers and sisters, Lord, who have made their confession in you. But Lord, standing in the gap for those who have not considered you to be their king. Father, we pray now for those that are in hospital rooms and those that are behind prison walls, those, God, that are in homes that have been just so devastating, those that are on the street corners of life and have no hope and they've been disenfranchised, those fathers whose hearts have been broken and they feel like there's no restoration. We pray now, Lord, for this world. We pray now, Lord, for the inhabitants of and for God, we need you right now. We pray, oh God, and we pray now, Lord, your wisdom upon us that we will make right decisions. We need you now, Lord, to help us to walk through and navigate through these treacherous times. Somebody right now, Father, have a decision to make. Lord, we pray that you will give them your wisdom allow them to rest faithfully in your promises. Somebody has to go in a hospital room and be, and be hospitalized and be worked on, prod and poked on. But we pray God that your hand will rest upon them even through this crazy pandemic time that you would allow success and that you would cast away fears, that you would remove doubt Lord, have mercy upon our world, aspiring and out of control. People trying to do their own things. Not enough folks calling on your name, but we, the living church of God, we call upon your name today. Have mercy upon this entire world, Lord. Give us another chance. Father, for we need you right now. The songwriter says every hour, I would say every moment. And Father, as we approach the day of your return, God grant us your peace in the midst of Jesus, what he has done to glory by in your holiness. In the name of Jesus the Christ we pray, amen, and thank the Lord. Come on, tell the Lord, thank you. Amen. You not know that God is not only blessing us right now, but he is awesome. And let's sing together with our music ministry, the awesomeness of God. And if you never looked at him this way, he's awesome. Awesome takes on a great connotation, big word that means whatever needs to be done, God is able to do it. And there's nothing that he cannot do. He's awesome.
What a mighty God we serve. Heaven and earth adore him. Angels bow down before him. Why? Because he's the only true wise God, our Father. And he is awesome. You must attest to the fact today that there's nobody like him. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. He's awesome. Amen. Good preaching entrance into the presence of Almighty God. When the praises of the Lord goes up, his blessing will shower us down. I want to invite you today to continue to stay in the worshipful mode. Some people think worship is just uh, singing a song. The object of your singing is Almighty God, and that is true. But worship is also hearing the word of the Lord, talking to God, having God to talk back to us, hearing his word sermonically how he used weak vessel people peoples and he used them to his glory 
I'm one of those vessels that God wants to speak through today. Worship is not just hearing and not just singing, but it's also giving. Worship has not been completed until you serve this present age. So as we prepare in our hearts today to hear God's voice, the scripture reading that we had before talks to us in the 11th chapter is where I'm going to go back. And after I pray, I want to come pick up verse 6. And then we're going to allow the Holy One, the God of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our God, to talk to us. Heavenly Father, thank you today, Lord, that you are awesome. And Lord, you have our attention beyond what we are experiencing. And we know there are a myriad of emotions going on throughout this world. But thanks be to you, O oh God, for allowing us to come and, and acknowledge to a world that you are the only true wise God, our Father, and you're blessing us right now. You're so awesome. So now, Lord, feed us from heaven until we can handle no more. We're clay, you're the potter. Mold us and shape us. And forevermore we will sing praises, lift up our hands to you, to honor your name. In the matchless name of the Lamb that was slain, in Jesus' name we pray. Say together, Amen, Amen, and Amen. God bless your hearts. In the 11th chapter, I would advise you and ask you to get a copy of the Holy Writ. The 11th chapter, verse 6 says, But without faith, that's enough. I want to talk to you today from this subject. The stages of our faith. Amen. The stages of of our faith. We've heard a whole lot to be said about faith. Been a lot to do about faith. When we look at this, this 11th chapter really is a biographical uh, summation of individuals that have displayed their faith. And, and more poignantly, display their faith in God. That's most important because when we think about faith, everyone has faith, but not everyone has faith in God. When I think about this, if you really want to deal with the difficulties of life, and there are many in our lives today, you have to keep your focus on God. He is the only one that understands what you're going through. You and I have to acknowledge the fact that he is in total control of everything that happens in and around us. And if we are going to be faith walkers, faith in God, you hear me through this sermon talking about mind where your focus is. That's important because to wander off and focus on the problems of life, not to say that you don't have them, but to focus on the problems of your life at this present time doesn't even, uh, really shouldn't even be in the category of when we focus upon him because he's the problem solver. Our Lord, he is the one who loves us and, and is in control. He's omniscient. He is omnipresent and shown of. He wields omnipotence. That's power. He is the one that has made promises and he always keep his promises. And he will never change the theological context of that word 
takes on a greater connotation when you look at it from the Greek. It says he's immutable. That means he can't change. When you think about so much is changing around us, thanks be to God that he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It is very clear in the scriptures that Jesus always honors faith. Now, I see in verse 1, the writer says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That is the result of the act or the actuation of faith. That's not the real definition of faith. The real definition of faith, layman's term, is this, resting your fullness of your being upon him, the Lord, who is high and lifted up. Whether you sense him, can see him, trace him, or track him, you can put your full weight upon him. And if we are going to be faith walkers, and every believer should be involved in walking in faith. As many of you may be sitting now, you're sitting on an object, and you didn't check it out to see what it hold you. You just plopped it right down because you had faith, and you had faith that it would hold you because it has, it's, hold, it's held you uh, before. Yeah, when you think about you sit around your table, you sit on, in your driver's seat of your car, when you sit on some apparatus, and because you've done it before, it gives you that opportunity and confidence that it can hold you again. You, sometimes we put more faith in these things than we do our God, who knows the ending from the beginning who loves us so much that he will not stop trying to, to accost us so that he may encroach us, that he may save us. But many people don't have the faith that God requires. And when we think about faith, faith is not just something we talk about. It is something that we do. And many want the faith that other folks portray but you have to go through a progression of things. Faith is not something that you just talk about or go to a seminar or go to a conference and get it. No, God allows faith that he's given to us as a mustard seed, and then he grows it up. How does he grow it up? He grows it up by allowing you and I to go through some situations some good, some bad, some indifferent, some hot, some cold, some low, some high, some in the middle. But he allows us to go through them so that our faith may be stretched. If we never have issues in life, our faith will still be mustard seed. But that many of us today can attest to the fact that as a result of having gone through some things, been orchestrated by God, that our faith in him has increased, you would never know and you would never understand that God is a rock in a weary land until you get in a weary land. And the same God that promised us that he'll never leave us is already in our weariness and he would allow us to have the joy of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, when I think about this, it's, it is Jesus was spending time with his disciples. And the Bible says that he was spending time with them, his three and a half years of ministry, trying to get them to understand the importance of why he came. And also to get them into the formulation moments of life that they would tread through some difficult times. But he was preparing them. And he spent a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with those 12 apostles and other disciples to get them to operate in faith. And so trying to teach them the importance of having faith and because the faith that we need in order to operate in this world will affect every aspect of our lives. 
Just like I gave you the illustration about sitting on that apparatus, sitting in that chair, sitting wherever you are sitting to believe that it will hold you because you've gone through it. It really, faith really affects every aspect of our lives. If you're going to be able to have joy, you have to have faith. If, if, even when it comes to having peace, you got to have faith. When it comes to having these creature comfort things such as a good job, a nice home, a nice automobile, nice threads of clothing, there has to be faith. In order to be able to matriculate through schools, even though we are academic in our thoughts, there has to be faith. And even when it comes to healing, it is predicated upon our faith. Not our faith in persons, in events, in things, but our faith in God. And he was spending time, Jesus was, with those disciples trying to display them. They saw him at moments of time taking blind eyes and, and open them. Every time you see God does do something in your life or in the lives of others, it ought to increase your faith in him. One preacher told me years ago, said, you don't have to go through every situation in life. You can learn from others. And I understand it, and I appreciate him saying that to me early on in my ministry move because it is important that when you see God open doors for others and when the door is closed in your face, what he's done for others he can do for you, but you have to have faith that he's able to do it. And he comes back, and when I think about this, Jesus, and now at the point where we are in the text, he's been resurrected. And he's found that the disciples are operating in unbelief because the opposite of faith is unbelief. You would never sit down on anything if you don't believe that it will hold you. You would never, ever accomplish anything if you didn't have faith to know and believe that it is possible. And Jesus, after those three and a half years walking with them, talking with them, and if you have a moment, it, Turn with me to the, to the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark, the 16th chapter and verse 14. And uh, it may not appear on your screen, but, but it's one that you can take note of it because it is the moment when I was just talking about how the opposite of faith is unbelief and the opposite of unbelief should be faith. Notice in verse 14, he says, Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and unbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. You know what the Lord was saying? He said, after y'all, after I have told you that I was coming back, that three days I will rise. That was the theme of my messages that I'm going, I'm going to Calvary's cross. And on this first Sunday, that's why we come and we participate in the Lord's Supper because we don't come cast down. We come with our hearts and mind regulated. We walk by faith because we know he ain't on Calvary's cross no more. He's now sitting on the right-hand side of God, and he's praying, the Bible says, interceding for us. And he had told them, and then after he had been resurrected, he had others to witness the fact that he had, he had risen, and they went back and told the disciples that they had problems with unbelief. Jesus comes in, and he, this is one of those times that he's always compassionate. Even when he's chiding, he's compassionate and loving. And he comes strongly because he has now not yet ascended to the Father. The Bible says he came to appear to them to reassure them that what I said it has come to fruition. My brothers and sisters, when you see God do a thing in the lives of not only you but others, it helps you to believe and acknowledge that there's nothing too hard for him. But they had unbelief. And y'all, before we get too hard on those, those apostles, those disciples back in that day, those followers of Christ, 
You and I have that same problem from time to time. We have that problem with, with believing that God really can do it. Now we are almost in a year and a half of this pandemic and Corona has really upset so many people, lost their lives. And there are many that really doubting the fact that Jesus is real. Some folks think that God is just talking and there's no credence behind it because they have wavering faith. I want to help you out today because it's important to know that, that God can be trusted. You may, not, you may not trust people, you may not trust government, but you can trust him with all of your being, with every ounce of your, of your, of your being, you can trust him. But there's a real devil, and he tries to get us to doubt. And I want to take you, take a few moments. You got a pen and a pad. Write these things down. I want to talk about some obstacles of our faith. Because at the beginning, you say, Rev, you, I thought you were talking about the stages of faith. I am. But I need to talk to you at the beginning, the obstacles of faith as we move and vacillate from stage to stage of our faith. There are always going to be some obstacles in life. If there never was any rain, you and I wouldn't appreciate the sunshine. God allows to rain on the just as well as the unjust. God allows trials and tribulations to come into the body of Christ. We who belong to him to grow us, to stretch us so that our faith will be better. But there are always going to be obstacles. And here's some obstacles that I want to kind of just bring out to you kind of briefly. Just to write them down. Put them in your Bible. Because this week, you're going to have to deal with something that if you're not anchored in Jesus Christ, and if your faith is not in him, you are going to operate in unbelief. And when unbelief sets in, it's because it now brings about obstacles to our faith. And so when I think about it, write this down, if you will, some of the obstacles. One is human reasoning. And when I think about and use that word, that, that term, those terms, human reasoning. I mean, you just, you talk yourself out of being blessed by God because somebody said you weren't going to amount to anything. Human reasoning, it's too big for me. I can't handle it. That, that, hurt, that hurt Moses when God was calling him to go to Pharaoh. I can't talk. But listen, God loves us so much that he goes beyond our unbelief and still works on our behalf. And the Bible says a lot of times we don't realize it, but human reasoning can be obstacles when it comes to our faith growing. Just because you can't, you can't feel it, just, just because you can't understand it, just because... It's, it's, it, it's, it don't make sense doesn't mean that it's not God in the middle of it. Because most time when we try to look at God in a human way with our own abilities, we, it really doesn't make sense. Like it doesn't make sense to give God your total allegiance when so many folks are trying to buy for themselves. But we know that we can't make it through this life without him. There's a second one that is an obstacle that I want to talk to you, not only human reasoning, but uh, also living by sight. Oh, if I can't see it, I can't have it. Listen, God didn't call us to walk by sight. It may look deplorable right now. Your situation may be so dismal right now. In fact, it may be black, but can I tell you? That's an obstacle, you leading yourselves in situations looking for your optical human eyes. It'll mess you up every time. Some things don't look right, but that doesn't mean that it's not right. And then there are some things that look good, but it may not be good for you. Human reasoning would bring about obstacles. Living by sight 
would bring about an obstacle to your faith. Thirdly, surrendering to feelings. If it feels good, do it. Not always. And if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Sometimes it, I don't feel like praising the name of the Lord because I'm going through some things. But God don't operate in feelings. Can I tell you who operates in feelings? Mankind and Satan is the author of it. Always, it feels good, do it. No, no, God didn't call us to be operators by our feelings. There have been a lot of people that have missed the blessing, that missed the, the opportunity to be used by God because of your feelings. Don't surrender to your feelings. I know it's hard right now. And I may not understand what you're going through, nor you me. But one thing is certain that you cannot pack up your bags, pull down your tent, and move away from God because of your feelings. Fifthly, negative counsel. Fourthly, negative counsel. Watch. Who can affect your faith in a negative way cause it to not grow is being around negativity. There's so much you can be negative about, but when you think about it, some one writer said, songwriter said, count your blessings, name them one by one. I declare to you that if you start a naming, counting your blessings today, I guarantee you, especially if you've been born again, your, your blessings will always outweigh your negatives. Be careful listening to negative counsel. Don't let nobody tell you that you can't do it when God has said you can. Don't let anybody cause you to move away from where God has placed you because of negative. Tell anybody that belonging to a church won't give you happy days all the time, won't be good days all the time, but tell them the truth that when you become a part of the body of Christ, one thing you can know is that you have downs, but you also have ups. And even in the midst of your downs, you can have joy. Stop listening to negative counsel. It affects your faith. Then also, feelings of guilt. Feelings of guilt. What do you mean, preacher? You're looking at your past. Your past has paralyzed your present. Because you're still in your past, and you can't do nothing in your present. And if God lets you see a, in your future, you won't be doing nothing there if you are capsized by guilt. Who in the body of Christ, who in this world, haven't made mistakes? The problem is that we just shouldn't wallow in it, but we've all made mistakes and that's why, we, that's why we are soldiers of the cross. We, we've all made mistakes, but thanks be to God who did everything well, gave us his son, Jesus Christ, and as a result of him doing everything greatly, we can rest in, in his work. We're going to make mistakes. We just don't want to wallow in it. And please don't let your past, don't let your past, the feeling of the guilt, capsize your faith. Then neglecting God's word. I've been trying to get our church to get involved more with the word of God, more so than the words of people. We need that. These things will affect your faith. If you don't read God's word, you won't know that God can do what he says he can do. If you don't read the word of God and spend time, I'm not talking about drive by I'm not talking about trying to be holy rollers. I'm talking about knowing the heart of God. We can know his heart in this regard as a result of spending time in his word. Don't neglect God's word. It builds our faith. When I see the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, lets me know that God, if he allows me to get there, the same God that was with them will be with me. When you think about those who have gone through some tribulation moments in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the early church, it lets me know that God was with them then, and he'll be with us as well. Don't neglect the word of God. In the word of God help us to know the difference between right and wrong to make greater decision than, than having bad decision. Don't neglect his word, because if you do, it's an obstacle of growing your faith. And then continuing in sin. 
Continuing in sin. Somebody said, this is a good sermon already. We're going to be short today. Continuing in sin. Please don't do it. One, one, one well-noted woman preaching says that she is beyond sin. I said, oh, my God. Even on our best day, we got that fallen nature in us. Though God has saved our soul, but our man, fleshly man, is still operating sometimes because we give over to him. God doesn't want us to continue. And you'll never in this life get to the point where you have gotten to the point where you won't sin. The fact that you say you're not a sinner, you just sin. That's why 1 John 1, 9 is there to help us to understand when we slip up every now and again, and we do because of our flesh. But don't rest there. Just confess it and know that he's faithful and just. Can I get a witness? Don't continue in sin. Stop wallowing in sin. Stop dating sin. Stop marrying sin. Then finally, Satan's tactics, they've not changed. He was sly, slick, and devilish then, and he's still like that now. He'll never tell you what you're about to do. Won't tear you up, cause, cause you trouble. You know what Satan's biggest lie is? Is to deceive us, to pull us away from God. A couple of years, uh, we started to go along. So some, some many years ago, we started a family thing, trying to go to the beaches and do things with the family and do that once a week, once a, once a year. And, uh, and uh, it's amazing, went out to the beach and got out to the water and something was a little choppy uh, on it. We saw the waves before they got into the shore, but they was choppy outside. And, and uh, they call that, when that's going on, they call that undertow. And when the water's right on the shore, seems to be kind of ease and nothing going on seems to be at peace, then all of a sudden an undertow can come and pull you not push you back towards the shore, but pull you from the shore. That's what Satan wants to do. He sometimes he'll, he will try any tactic that he's used before to get us to come away from God. Sometimes it'll be sickness. Sometimes it'll be acquaintances. Sometimes it might be a job. Sometimes it might be an event. But remember, God allows things to happen in our lives, not to drive us, but to draw us. And so have, you take, those, you take those, those uh, obstacles that I've talked to you about and write them down. You who didn't write them down, shame on you, because you need to be able to have some type of litmus test when you're going through what you're going through. Why are you responding to life situations? And this can help you. And even in this, the rest of this message today, you're going to see some of these elements occur. And look at yourselves and notice what you've gone through and see where you are in your faith. I want to talk to you today from the stage, about the stages of faith. The first stage is what I call today is little faith. We look at the text, the Bible says, that faith is, it is, you can make a notation, it is struggling faith. It is, it is a wearisome faith. It is struggling. It is trying to make it through it. It is, it is like you, you believe one moment and you unbelieve next moment. It, it's like you, you have confidence one moment, and then before that moment is over with, expired, you, you have no confidence. It's it almost like I heard, I, I think, I think God can do it, but I'm not really, I'm really not anchored that he can. It, it, is, that, it is that struggle in faith. And let me tell you, struggling, is, it's good to have some type of faith, but, but don't get bad and get down on yourself because you might operate in, in what I call little faith. Little faith is not bad for a beginner in Christ. Little faith is not, not bad for those who are still uh, drinking the milk of the word of God. Little faith, so everyone has to start somewhere. But, but little faith, if it does not mature and remains little faith, you're going to struggle through your life until you go to heaven. 
You're going to struggle with the fact that some things I went through, some problems I had, God, God had given me the answers, but I didn't believe that he could do it. When I think about it, let me give you a few examples from the scripture. This is one of those sermons that's not expository. It's what I call topical. Getting scriptures from over here, but talking about the same theme. If you will, turn to Matthew, the 8th chapter, and look at verse 23 through 27. Matthew, the 8th chapter, verse 23 through 27. Praise the Lord. He says, and when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep, Jesus was. And the disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great Calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Can I tell you that these disciples, they, they were still growing. They had seen Jesus do a lot of things. You and I, we ought to still, we ought to be growing, but little faith ought not to be our resting place. If you've been on the bandwagon, been in Christendom for any time over three or four years, you ought not to be vacillating around little faith, that struggling faith. If you've been in the Bible, been in church, you've been saved long enough to believe that God not only saved you, but that God has ordered your steps, God has made a way for you, then you ought not to be resting in little faith, not struggling through every moment of your life. Listen, that's not having true faith in God when every moment of your life, every day is a struggle. God doesn't want us to live like that. He's given us that, that blessed assurance. And all he asks us to do is just trust him, put our, put our weight on him. Trust him even when you can't smell him, trace him, track him, feel him. These disciples, they were on their boat and the, and the winds blew and Jesus was asleep. Not that he wasn't in with compassion and caring about them. God always is in teaching moments in our lives. He didn't even have to let the, the storm come. But he did because it was a teaching moment to, to grow the faith. At least they had enough sense to go to Jesus. Care is not that we perish. Some folks got, listen, some folks are so weak in their faith and struggling in life. Because of weak faith, because they go to the wrong place. Listen, when you got a problem in your spiritual life, you don't need to be going to a banker. You don't need to be looking at what come from the government. You need to be leaning, stretching out, calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. There's another one I want to share with you that's in the Bible, if you will. Turn, if you will, to Mark, the ninth chapter. Mark, the ninth chapter, verse 17 through 24, talking about struggling faith, little faith. He says in verse 17, are you there? Watch this, he says, and one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And whatsoever he take, and, and wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnashed with his teeth. And pineth away. And I spake to your disciples. He didn't say yo, he says thy disciples, that they should cast him out, and they could not. Verse 19, he answered him and said, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. That's the God that we serve. The disciples should have been able to do that had they been, had they grown in their faith, but they're displaying little faith. Struggling faith. Verse 20 says, And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he answered, and he asked his father, How long is it ago since the, he came unto this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters and to destroy him. But if thou canst, but if thou can, canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, I, if, thou, if, if thou canst believe, 
All things are possible to him that believe. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. I'm not down on little faith. I just know that every time God takes you higher, your faith ought to increase. There ought to be always the opportunity of maturing faith. Not only did the disciples have display of little faith during this last event that I just took you through, but also the man had little faith. If you, if you can't, if I always look at the word, don't use that word if towards, towards my God. There's nothing too hard for him. One thing I've learned, I ain't been on the bandwagon all my life, but enough to know that there's no ifs when it comes about God. Whatever God has said, God can bring it to pass, and whatever God has done, can't nobody refute it. The Bible tells us that God can do anything, not no ifs. Thief on the right, thief on the left. The one on the left said, if you be the son of God. And that's where he left himself. The one on the right says, when you're coming to your kingdom, remember me. That's the difference when your faith has been tested, it's been strained, it's been stressed. It moves you from struggling faith, which I call little, and takes you to my next one, great faith. So we dealt with the little faith, the stages. Now, can I tell you this? This, is, this doesn't mean that you may not go back to a little faith because you're now displaying great faith. In fact, what is great faith? When we think about it, it is a maturing faith that stands on God's word without wavering. Say it again, pastor. It is maturing faith that stands on God's word without wavering. It is, listen, the maturing faith that stands on the word of God without wavering. I don't care what it looks like. If God said you're going to get through it, hook it up and get through it. Not wavering, even if you don't see your substance in your hand. If God has said it in his word, you can make it. I don't care what the doctors had said. I don't care how the examiner has looked at you as a result of looking at your physical body, seeing your organs all torn. But if God says it's not unto death, then live on that promise and rest in his joy. When I think about this, y'all remember David and Goliath? We heard about it when we were in first Sunday school and vacation Bible school. It's amazing how David exemplified great faith. He a little teenager, and there Goliath out there wreaking havoc on the armies of Israel and dogging out his brothers, dogging out our God. And David was going to give a meal to his brothers and saw what was going on. Y'all remember David, little teenage boy, David, one slingshot, five smooth stones. Y'all remember David approached that Goliath and displayed great faith. He had five stones, but when, can I tell you, you may not have five this, four this, three that, two that, but if you just got trust in God, God is able to slay any giant in your life. Y'all ain't shouting. That's where y'all to be screaming out because there's nothing too hard for him if you just trust God. David really was exemplary of having great faith, that maturing faith that what stands on the word of God and not allowing the wind to blow you off of it. I don't know what you're going through, but stand still. I don't know how bad it might be, but notice that God has not abandoned you. Don't you give up on your faith. Your faith got you saved, and your faith will lead you on to glory. Don't give up on God 
Don't let a sickness, don't let an event, don't let a pandemic, don't let anything make you get off the word of God. Have faith in God and not anybody else. Can I get a witness? Let me show you some other patriarchs because David is a good example of exemplifying what I call great faith. But also turn to Matthew, the eighth, cha eighth chapter, and look at verse 5 through 10. Matthew, the eighth chapter, verse 5 and 10. Somebody said, preaching good up in here, preaching. You helping me out? I'm in the midst of almost hoisting up the red flag and giving up. Can I tell you? Don't give up. Stand faithful on the promises of God. Look at Matthew, the fifth chapter, eighth chapter, verse 5 said, And when Jesus was entering into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, looking for him. And saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. That, that means not just a little sick, tore up from the floor up, ebonic wise. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. Got to hear what Jesus said. I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof, but speak the word only. That's great faith right there. Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. He heard what Jesus said, and he was a man under authority himself. Even he had authorities over others, but somehow he heard about Jesus. Can I tell you? You may have nice homes. You may have good education. You may have money in your bank, but there are some things that you can't handle without God. The Bible says, he says, I ain't worthy of it. Lord, you can just speak the word in my servant. Ain't that a blessing? He says, for I am a man under authority and I having soldiers under me and I say to this man, go and to, to, to he and he goeth and to another come and he cometh and to my servant do this and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. That didn't mean he, Jesus put his hands down and head down into his hands and said, oh, my God. He said, Lord, have mercy. Look at this faith of this man. He got more faith than these that have been following me for three years. Notice what the text says. And he said to them that follow, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Can I give you another one? A couple of more, y'all, to help us out. Great faith. That, listen, can, listen, I got to say it again. The whole object is where your objectivity is. If your focus is on the uh, economy, economy, then, then you're going to be in a bad shape. Because, boy, gas prices, $2.49 for regular and you done been furloughed, and your car almost being repossessed. If you own the economy with your faith, if that's your object, you're in bad shape. No, no, no. Well, our faith is in God. Focus, remember, fo faith is about focusing. Focus on who God is, and God don't care anything about Price is going high. God, listen, God can't be perturbed by no pandemic. God, God is not scratching his head trying to figure out this, this coronavirus. God is not, God is concerned about us, but he's not worried about anything. And great faith will let you know, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Matthew, the 15th chapter, verse 21 said, And then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered at her not a word. And this disciple came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cried after us. But... Jesus answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it unto dogs. What he was saying here, to the Jews were the chosen generation. And then the Gentiles, she is representative of that. Watch God. Watch him. Watch him. And she said... True, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which shall fall, which shall, which fall from their master's table. 
And here it is. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Bulletin, been in. You may not, some events, you may not be strong to operate in great faith. You may have been on the bandwagon a long time in, the, in, in, in Christendom for years, and there be some things that have happened in your life that may cause you to operate in little faith. I can't tell you that once you get to great faith, you'll never go back to little faith. But I tell you that if you go back to little faith, if you have a maturing faith, you'll learn that I won't stay there alone. He may not do it like you want him to do it, but he's able to do it the way that's going to benefit you more. Amen. Here's what I need you to know. Sometimes with great faith, there are times you just got to wait. Let me say that again because people, there are some religious beliefs out here think that uh, the law of attraction and what the law of attraction is that you can just make God move his hand. Lord, have mercy. Don't you lie to yourself. God, first of all, has already done what he's going, what he's, what he's prop, purpose in his heart to do. But keep this in mind, just because you keep on saying it over and over and over and over and over, it's not going to make God's will change. Can I tell you, if you're going to say it over and over again, make sure you're saying the will of God, and then the will of God will come to fruition in your life. Because here's what you got to understand. Your focus will sometimes cause you, even in great faith, to have to wait. That's what's wrong with the world. We're going to have it right now. And we teach our little children, have it right now. Wait on the Lord, but be of good courage. Wait, I say, on the Lord. There are some times you can't hurry, God. You just got to wait until your change come. Come on, somebody. Sometimes you feel like I can't take no more. But remember, God knows how much you can take, and God won't pull you out until it's time. You just got to learn to wait on him. Here we are, another year of a pandemic, and people trying to open up, and, you know, they want to get rid of the mask and all that, then got a little confidence in that those uh, vaccine, vaccine that we've gotten. But can I tell you, there's no vaccine that man can make that can be 100% safe. You who, we who hadn't gotten it yet because we still waiting on it, why we hadn't gotten it? It's not because we got it going on. We operating in great faith. No, it's God's grace and mercy. And can I tell you, there's some folk that got it, but then God brought them through. Well, Red, what about them that got it and died? Does it mean they had little faith? Not necessarily. If you've been born again, we don't know how we're going to leave here. But we do know that he went to prepare a place for us. And where he is, we can be also. Great faith will sometimes just wait. Amen. Can I give you one more on the great faith? That means standing on the promises. It's a maturing faith. It is, it is it's growing by day by day, event by event. Turn, if you will, to Matthew, the ninth chapter, and look at verse 20 through 22. Matthew, the ninth chapter, verse 20 through 22. Are you with me still? I'm almost done. And the Bible says in verse 20, and behold, a woman, y'all know this woman, which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years, y'all know her, came behind him, came behind him. Uh, if I had time, I'd preach that right there, came behind him. Make sure you're falling behind the right one. And touch the hem of his garment. They, they shout all over the place. You, you're missing it, though. You're missing it. Uh, this, this woman displayed great faith. For she said within herself, hit of great faith. Watch what it said. If I may but touch his garments, I shall be made whole. But Jesus turned around about. And when he saw her, he said, daughter, be of good comfort. Yeah, thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole. 
from that hour. How did she know that Jesus could do it? Because somebody else, he did it in them, and they got to talking about what he did for me. He can do that for you. And great faith may sometimes not always look great, but it will wait until the change comes. This woman went to every doctor, spent all her money, but every round ought to go higher and higher. The doctors can't fix you. The economy can't help you. But I got a man named Jesus can do everything well. Just got to trust him. And he said, woman. In fact, he didn't say woman. He said, daughter. That means that she had not only known him, but she done tried him for herself. If I must just but just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. That's great faith. She spoke it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Not, not trying to call something that ain't and God had, no, had nothing to do with. No, no, waiting on God. Yeah, rain and pouring down in your life. The doctor has given up on you. But listen, great faith will always be a maturing faith that even while in the midst of what you're going through, you're going to stand steady. Wait on the Lord. Hell or high water, the old folks used to say. And I don't know what you're going through, but if you've been born again, wait on the Lord. I don't care how many times they done taken you to this place, to that place. Wait upon God. I don't care how many ditches they've been digging for you. Wait on the Lord. I want to conclude this message talking about the stages of faith. Remember, the common denominator is where your focus is. Your focus got to be on God. Is your faith is object is your car, your house, your money, your things, your children, your this and your that. You are going to be miserable. But if your faith is in Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Even in the midst of joylessness, you can have joy. You can have peace. You can have blessed assurance. Finally, let me talk to you about what we all should be ascribing to, to get to. And I want to call this one perfect faith. Little faith, struggling. Great faith, standing still on the promises of God, learning how to wait, focusing on him. Perfect faith. Perfect faith is this. That God said it in his word. Ta-da, and it's done. Perfect faith won't keep on bothering God about something that he's already said, I'm going to do. <laughs> Wasting your time talking. To every, your, your prayer don't change. You asking God to do this, and he's already done it. Listen, God says, I ain't going to do it on your time, but I'm going to do it for you. Why you keep bothering God? Somebody says, if you have faith, you keep on messing with God. No, if you got faith to what God has said, if God said he's going to take care of your life, you ain't got to keep on asking God to take care of your life. When you get to that perfect faith, you don't have to have all them words. When you get in trouble and something has happened because you didn't, you, didn't, you, didn't, you didn't anticipate it to happen, but you know what you heard, what God says, that listen, it may come high waters in your life, but don't worry about it. I got you. You don't need to be in, in the high waters time thinking that God asking, oh, God, you got to help me. He's already said, I got you. Paul then was sailing towards Crete. That's Roman. And Paul anticipation and desire was to get to Rome to preach to those Gentiles that hadn't, hadn't heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And listen, God would, God would honor our faith if we would just trust him. Let me help you, and I'm going I'm, to I'm, I'm ask somebody to do something for me. It's unscripted, and we're almost done. So let me, get, let me take you to James, the second chapter, in verse 18 through 22. So when we think about this perfect faith, you see it in God's word. 
And you know what you say? It's done. If you, God says you're more than a conqueror, then start acting like a conqueror. Quit bothering God about, Lord, I need you to make me more than a conqueror. Now, he's already made you because Jesus got in your way and did what you couldn't do. Amen. James says in the 18th verse, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by, by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devil also believes and tremble. But, it, but, but wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seeing thou hast faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? Yeah, yeah, if God said it, it is done. If God says you shall live and not die, Stop bothering God about trying to give your life. He's already said, I'm going to give your life. You, you will not die. I said, what you talking about? Aren't you glad that a whole lot of things may happen in this life, but when God saved your soul, he sealed you unto the day of redemption. And thanks be to God that this body going back to the dust of the earth. I, got, I, don't, want, I don't want this body no more. Gray hair, can't see, can't hardly hear, can't hardly walk, get up, don't know what you got up to get up to do. But God got a glorified body that he's going to put the saved soul in one day. It's not our home, we're just pilgrims traveling. Let me tell you about that perfect faith. You got your Bibles, open to Genesis and we're almost done. Genesis. Genesis the uh, 22nd chapter, look at verse 1 through 5, and I'm almost where I need to be. Genesis 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did, attempt, God did tempt Abraham. Now, that ain't the tempt. When you break it back down, get into the Greek, it's not tempting because God don't tempt no man because he can't be tempted. That word tempted takes on the connotation of testing. And anybody in here can raise your right hand and left hand know that your faith didn't grow by not being tested. Your faith grew because you were tested and you came forth as pure gold. You thought it was going to take you out, but God tested. So in a play on words, and not that the scripture was done in error. No, there's no error in God's word. It's just, to, just, just look at it and know, thank God for Bible scholars that can help us out. He said, and Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, behold, here I am. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. <laughs> that, that's, that's perfect faith right there. I mean, when, when you know, I know it don't look right around you. You don't know how it's going to turn out. But early signifies that when I, I went to bed trusting him and I woke up trusting him. Watch this. The Bible says, and Abraham rose up early and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, and clave the wood of the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Come on, can I tell you? Perfect faith don't have, to, don't have to have a GPS design. Perfect faith don't have to have every turn. Per perfect faith just need to remember what he, God, has said. In verse 5, and Abraham said unto his young men, I want you, listen, listen, uh, listen. I know you looking at your watch, getting ready to eat the sacrament. Don't you? Listen, listen. Listen to me. Notice verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass. And I and the lad, Isaac, will go yonder and worship, underline that, and worship 
and come to you and come again to you. Let me capsule that. When you have this perfect faith, it doesn't mean that you don't get a little displeasure sometimes and a little displeased and a little disposed in your mind. It doesn't mean that everything going along smoothly. But it does mean that when you're operating in perfect faith, you don't let because you can't come to church. You don't let because you can't see your friends like you used to. You don't let because your job has been downsized. You don't let even because your body is racked with pain. You don't let nothing stop you from worshiping the king of kings, the Lord of lords. Notice what Abraham did. He says, I and the lad, we going to church. <laughs> and church is just not in a building. Church is wherever you are. God is not in brick and mortar. He's in the hearts of people that have accepted him. And he says, not only are we going to worship, but we will again come. <laughs> How many times you've been in a situation and you started off with little faith and struggling with that thing, but then as God took you and brought you and delivered you and you got in other things, you find yourself moving up to sometimes great faith. That I'm going to stand right here. I don't see the end. I can't trace him, track him. But I'm going to believe what he has said, and I'm not going to waver. And every now and again, when your faith is on a maturing scale, you'll get into that thing where you say, I don't see it, but I'm going to trust him, and I'm going to keep on doing what he called me to do. I'm going to, I'm going to, ask, I'm going to ask Clifford Tony to come here for a minute. Clifford, come here for a minute. Y'all, this is not scripted. I just thought about this, and it'll work, to display perfect faith. Stand right there, if you will. What Abraham had Isaac, and I know it's kind of kind of muffled in the sound. You ain't got to worry about trying to fix it because the ocular demonstration is going to speak what he might be muffled. And God want us to eventually get to perfect faith. Turn around, Clifford, facing that way. Put your hands, put your hands across, yeah, just like that. And do you trust Pastor Wells? Yeah, you do. Do you trust Pastor Wells enough to believe that Pastor Wells, if you fail backwards, will catch you? Be truthful now. Be truthful. You're on national TV. Be truthful. Yeah, he's some of yeah. All right. Do you believe that God, do you believe in God? Do you believe that God won't ever fail you? Do you have enough faith in him that you will let your entire body go? Will you do that? So I'm not God, but I'm operating as God just for this sermon. He is perfect faith. I ain't too much bigger than him. I got some struggles in my life. But when he think about God, what struggle does God have? Not one. Just lean your body on me. And this is what this this is what perfect faith is. Been on down. Been on down. Been on down. You don't see him wailing. You don't see his arms moving. This is an example of perfect faith. And as a result, God. Uh, Send you on your way. Hallelujah. <laughs>
Hallelujah. Just fall back on him. And that's what Abraham did. He said, me, the lad and I, going to do what God told us to do. And he had that dagger in his hand, Isaac the sacrifice on the altar. And he pulled his hand back. God wasn't trying to figure out what Abraham was going to do. God already knew what Abraham was going to do. God was letting Abraham see what he was all about. And God let Abraham's son Isaac to see what he was about. And God let those men that went with him to see his faith. And he came back and he, he was going to sacrifice his son who would be the one that would make many nations. You got to keep your focus on God. Can I get a witness? That's what Jesus did. <laughs> no man taketh my life. I lay it down. And just as I lay it down, I pick it up again. Jesus exemplified how we can operate in perfect faith. Sometimes we may be in weak, little faith. Sometimes some events may occur in our lives. I know I have them too that you may operate, did a great job, and use and display great faith. And then there are some times when you've been with God through the muck and the mire, and even though you don't understand, you can't sense him, track him, can't understand him, one thing you know, you remember what he said, I'll be with you to the ends of the world. Amen. Bless your heart. I want you to prepare your hearts now today. Boy, we in the Lord's Supper, we call it the time where we come at least once a month and participate in the Lord's Supper, where Jesus gathered all of the disciples that could fit into that room, those 12 that was with him, they met him there, and, and the Bible says that he initiated what we call today the Lord's Supper. There is no saving grace in this ordinance there are two ordinances that he tells us to participate in. One is baptismal, and there's no salvation in baptismal. But then the other one is the Lord's. We call it communion. Some people call it the Eucharist. But it is a time that we come as a result of having been saved, that it shows our unification, that we anchored in the rock of our salvation, which is Jesus Christ. So Jesus in the upper room, he had them to prepare right before his crucifixion, a time that he would initiate the Lord's Supper. This is his table here. And as we prepare to come down to this, we have to search ourselves. Turn your radios off. They should have been the TV. Don't turn that off because you look, you're watching. But, but please keep your focus on him. Remember? The stages of faith, every stage ought to have the focus of him. The Bible says that he gathered them together. In 1 Corinthians, you'll see where we get our intention from. He says in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, this is what he says. Verse 23, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. 
For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye should not together, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Jesus says, I will not eat this with you today, but I will reserve it until we all you come into my kingdom. And so as we come today, um, a prayer is in order that we examine ourselves individually. You, while I'm praying, you ought to be praying. Not if you find anything in me that ain't right. No, you know what it is. And if you don't ask him, he'll tell you. Heavenly Father, we come, we pray now, Lord, that you forgive now our sins. We have sinned before you, Lord, and we come short of your glory. We ask now, God, that you would honor us as always, Lord, as your children. As we come, Lord, with a repentant spirit, we turn not one, one 360, but we turn 180 away from it. We ask now, Lord, that you would not only sanctify our minds, but sanctify our thoughts. This morning, Lord, as we come, we ask your blessings upon our time together. Now, Lord, we ask that these symbols that are presented before us here, God, the bread that represents your body that was given for us, we pray now, Lord, that you will bless it. And the fruit of the vine, God, which represents the New Testament, is your blood that washed away all of our sins. Now, Lord, here we are, broken, marred vessels. But, Lord, we thank you that our faith is in you. We've never seen you like others have in the early church, but Lord, we believe your word. Sometimes we vacillate between little faith, great faith, and sometimes occasionally perfect faith. Well, Lord, thank you for giving us that maturing spirit that you would continue to grow us, that we would trust you anyhow. Our focus is upon you always. Yes, we can talk about the negative, the things of life, but Lord, we rather glory in your presence, your power, as we submit ourselves afresh to you. Have your way with us today, and we pray it all in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And the Bible says, they took the bread and after he had blessed it, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let us all eat together. After they had eaten of the bread, he took the cup. took the cup this is the new testament in my body my blood this do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me let us drink together Sun. 
Oh Lord, oh Lord. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. Let us praise God together on our knees. When I fall, when I fall, when I fall. mercy on our souls, O oh Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on, clap your hands unto the Lord. Amen. Clap your hands. God bless your heart. If you don't know Jesus Christ, this is a good time to know him. Just confess your sins. Be sorry for them. By faith, ask him into your heart. He'll save you today. And he'll change your destination. Heaven will be your home. Those who know him, you don't leave him. Trust him. Put your full weight up on him. Don't flail away. Don't fret. Don't worry. Trust God. He'll never fail. God bless your heart. Today we're going to ask that Patrice Pruitt would come and give us some announcements and listen to her. Don't go nowhere. Benediction will be after that. Stay for your blessing. And I want to ask that uh, Sister Pruitt, would you come right now and speak to us? Let us hear. If you prayed the sinner's prayer, we welcome you to the body of Christ. It is important that you connect to a Bible-based, Christ-centered church. And if that connection is here at the Grove, we welcome you to our church family. Please contact us immediately following this broadcast so that we can gather more information from you and personally welcome you to the Grove. Contact us at 205 786 Three three five one. Thank you for your loving kindness and obedience through the giving of your tithes and offering to this ministry. Continue to make your contributions by cash app, PayPal, mail, or our drop service. Your obedience allows this ministry to continue to reach God's children who are diligently seeking him for his truth and his promises. Saturday morning wake up, which is our Sunday school, is always lit. If you have joined the conversation, you heard the mentioning of knowing your spiritual gifts in several of the lessons we discussed. If you want to know your spiritual gift or gifts, contact the church at 205-786-3351 so that an assessment can be mailed or emailed to you. Further instructions will be given upon your request. 
Our pastor is celebrating his birthday Friday, March 12th. We want to give him a celebration of overflow, an overflow of our love, an overflow of our appreciation, and an overflow of our finances. His cup will run over because he has been called by the Most High, but because he is our shepherd, Grove Knights, we want to give him our overflow. Let's flood his cash app all week. The dollar sign, the treetop. All T's are capitalized. Let's show our love to our pastor. COVID-19 cases are steadily increasing. We only see a decrease in the number of cases reported in the last 14 days. But Alabama is only 181 cases away from 500,000 total cases in the state as of this morning. Please continue to wear your mask, social distance, and avoid large gatherings. Wash your hands thoroughly and often for 20 seconds with warm water and soap. God bless you. Have a blessed week and stay safe. Boy, it's been a hot service today. All of them are, but uh, there's something about this one. This is what I need you to do for me. My wife is having a medical procedure this week and I want you to be praying for her and uh, praying that, uh, that uh, all will work out well. Uh, normally, you, my wife is like a rock. She's a rock and she, uh, she still is. And uh, God has really kept his hands upon the, uh, the first family and uh, and sometimes we do have ups and downs. We try not to, to not uh, talk about the little things, but thank God for he's growing our faith, uh, just like we're just regular people like you are. And so uh, we do need your prayers. And I know that you're always praying for us. I sense it all the time. But I just want you to be praying for my wife and uh, uh, that uh, everything will come through well. And uh, uh, remember, that that's the kind of faith we need to example exemplify that is, you know, don't let it be little faith too long. If you get there, come out of it, get into great faith. And, and if you keep on maturing in your faith that God brought you through some things, then rest on that, what we call perfect faith. That is that faith that when God said it, let's hook it up. He said he can pull a truck, then hook that duck up and watch him do it. Amen. That's the kind of God we serve. He knows where we are. We are human beings. But remember, he's, he's, he's renewing us and he's transforming our mind. Again, thank you for joining us throughout this virtual worship service. And thank our members for what you do always. We bless your, bless your name. We give you praise. Thank God for you and your prayers. And then our friends who have come on across the city, across the nations uh, that have come on with us. We're just so excited that you're remaining with us. That's a blessing. I'd like for you to do this. I'd like for you to share this always, every Sunday. Share it and like it. And click, y'all. Click, 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 share, click, like, click it. And uh, have, host some parties. Invite some friends. And then take this word. Somebody you know, if it's not you, might be going through some faithless moments. And you need to share with this. This message is going to be on It's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on uh, Facebook uh, throughout the duration. You get a chance. Point them to it. I know that other folks doing things too, but this may be just what they need. It's the word of the Lord. Amen. Well, we, uh, we're coming to a close for this service. We're getting ready to receive the benediction. But remember, we'll never leave the presence of God. He's with us. I want to thank our group, this bubble that we have here at the church. Thank y'all for your faithfulness. And we uh, thank God for those people who are working behind the scenes that uh, don't never get any kind of acclimates place that way we thank you too and god is blessing us so enjoy this week be prayerful and if you are in the bible marathon reading then make sure you out of the book of deuteronomy we need to be in joshua and we are almost getting in the middle of joshua so let's stay with it if you really want to join and and have a personal time with you and your god and his word then you can join with us just contact 
Uh, our secretary, Sister Verdell Balkins, at our church, 205-786-3351. And let her know, and she'll get that information to you. Her sidekick with her, Miss uh, Stella Howard, they'll get you that information so that you can participate. Is it too late for you to get involved? Yeah, kind of, sort of, but not really. You can go on. can't go back yesterday but start where you are. Amen. All right. Are you ready? Well, I am. God is good. What stage right now of faith are you in? That's the question that only you can answer. Whatever it is, have a focus on God. Live a clean life. Surrender to him. And God will give you whatever you stand in need of. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us henceforth and now forevermore. Sing with me. Amen. Amen. Sing. I love you and ain't a thing you can do about it. Be blessed this week and be a blessing.